I want to thank Senator Lee for uh, being such a good partner in this endeavor. Our hearing today is on Russia's policies and intentions towards specific European nations. One thing that we have in common with all these countries, they're young, struggling democracies, and they're friends of the United States. Uh, out of respect for your family, I will not pronounce any of your names. <laughs> I will try to get your country right, and you have an opportunity when you speak to, to tell us who you are. But uh, anyway, we have the uh, foreign minister from the Ukraine, ambassador from Poland, ambassador from Georgia, ambassador from Latvia, ambassador from Lithuania, and the ambassador from Estonia. I met most of you on my travels, and I can't thank you enough for coming to this hearing today and to share with the committee and really the American people what's going on in your backyard because you live in a very difficult neighborhood. Uh, I would like to welcome to the committee Senators Rubio and Van Hollen. It's going to be, uh, hopefully we can do things together good for the country. And I will make a short opening statement followed by Senator Leahy, and we'll have five-minute rounds. Uh, and again, to each of you, thank you very much for coming. Uh, very briefly, uh, everybody talks about what happened in our election in 2016. And let me tell you my views. The Russians tried to interfere in our election. Uh, I don't believe they changed the outcome, but it was the Russians who hacked into the Democratic National Committee. It was the Russians who compromised Podesta's emails. In my view, it was the Russians who provided that information to WikiLeaks and an uh, effort to interfere with our election. It is my belief that if we forgive and forget regarding our own election, we'll invite future aggression by other countries, that the Republican Party and Democratic Party should be one when it comes to foreign interference. An attack on one party should be considered an attack on all, and I want this subcommittee to lead the way uh, in terms of uniting our country, uh, starting with a subcommittee that is now time to push back against Russians, Russia's interference in democracy at home and abroad. The goal is to find out from these uh, countries what it's like to live in the shadow of Russia, what kind of interference they face in their daily lives, and what are the efforts, the tools, and the toolbox of Russia to undermine their democracies and for us to create a counter-Russia account, a soft power account. This committee has jurisdiction over foreign operations, and I'd like to try to convince most Americans it is in our interest to put some money aside to help these emerging democracies, uh, because at the end of the day, democracy should be a goal of all of us, simply because democracies tend not to go to war. And I want to make sure we can do whatever we can within reason Money is tight, but I think it would be a good investment to have a counter-Russia account, to put some money aside, maybe as cybersecurity assistance, maybe as trade assistance, whatever it is, that we can help you withstand this uh, assault on your democracies uh, by Russia. And that is the goal, to understand what's going on and to do something about it. And to each of you, thank you for coming to the subcommittee. I think if we can come together and produce a product, uh, history will judge us well. Senator Lee. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad you're having this uh, hearing. I, um, I want to mention that Tim Reeser is always helpful as giving me a phonetic pronunciation, but I'll still try to mix it up with, the, I think, the fact that we have representatives of Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, Georgia, Poland, Ukraine, places that many of us have visited, I know you have, and I know Senator Durbin has. Uh, we, we know the stakes involved. This is the second congressional hearing we've had in Russia since the beginning of the new administration. I suspect we're going to hear, have a lot more. It's also the first we have the benefit of hearing directly from the representatives of countries that have experienced Russia's military aggression and economic and political interference for many years. We understand the interference you've had. We now count ourselves among those who are facing the same kind of interference. We learned the Russian government interfered in our elections to further its own interests. And the new president said virtually nothing about it. 
He has made no secret of his admiration for President Putin. While he and other White House officials have disparaged American news media, if they've been critical of Putin, he's called them enemy, they call our American news media the enemy of the people. That's something we might expect of a President Putin, but not of the President of the United States. I feel we should have an independent investigation into Russia's interference in an election. Find out exactly what happens if we can take appropriate action. But at the same time, I think we have to have hearings like uh, Chairman Graham has uh, called here so that the American public will know exactly what's happened in other parts of the world and what we face. Uh, you get, there's one thing when we see our leaders attack in American media, uh, I'd happen to disagree with that. But I disagree with it even more when nothing is said about Vladimir Putin's ruthless campaign to silence his critics, especially to silence the Russian press. We have not heard any criticism from our president about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, Russia's occupation of Georgian territory, atrocities committed by Russian forces in Syria, their support for the Assad regime, or Russia's efforts to undermine stability and democracy across Europe. I think I want you to know that not everybody in this country is praising Vladimir Putin. I don't. The chairman does it. I think they're supporting the independence of our friends and allies when they're, when they're under a threat or attack is in the United States' national interest. I'll continue to work with Senator Graham. I want to ensure that U.S. assistance is made available for our partners in Eastern Europe and what the parts that were part of the former Soviet Union. But it's not because we're seeking a confrontation with Russia. It's because we recognize the importance of ensuring that our partners can maintain their sovereignty, provide for their people. Do I agree with the President saying we should have a constructive relationship with Russia rather than adversarial one? Yes, if that's possible. But I, we cannot ignore the significance of the Russian government's malignant activities toward us and our partners if we want to protect our own national interests. That's what we have to do first. Then we can talk about where we go diplomatically from there. So I thank you for having this is a very important lineup of witnesses. I thank all of you for taking the time. Thanks, Senator Lee. And we'll start with the Foreign Minister of the Ukraine, whose name is? Chairman Graham, Ranking Member Leakey, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify before you today. And of course, it's great to sit in the line here with friends in front of the subcommittee. Back in 1994, Still as a young diplomat, I was involved in the process of strategic nuclear disarmament. While working on Budapest Memorandum, I have already questioned its effectiveness and feasibility to ensure security of Ukraine. Still, and I have to say it, it was beyond my imagination that in 20 years, one guarantor of our sovereignty and territorial integrity, a permanent UN Security Council member, will invade Ukraine and occupy, occupy parts of its territory. Why did it happen? Here is the key to understanding what is the root cause of Russian policies and intentions towards European countries, particularly Ukraine. For Putin, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. From the very beginning, he was and still obsessed with the restoring of the former Russian greatest. Of course, it could be done in two ways. One way was to invest in building a strong democratic state with the rule of law and competitive market economy. 
honoring the international principles and order. But it was not the Russian choice. Instead, Kremlin resorted to aggressive expansionism in gross violations with the international law in different dimensions, breaking the UN Charter and Helsinki Final Act, undermining arms control, and possibly violating the INF and New START treaties, coercing with trade and energy pressure in contradiction to the WTO principles, and, of course, blatantly violating the human rights. Kremlin has developed the concept of hybrid warfare and launched it with the illegal annexation of Crimea and the invasion in Donbass. It's a highly sophisticated strategy, which mixes conventional aggression with economy and economic pressure, with propaganda is misinformation, as well as direct interference in the internal affairs of other countries. It's waged daily against peaceful countries to undermine, disrupt, and sow dissent. It's spearheaded in living rooms across the globe by the insidious television channel RT, which seeks not to promote any particular narrative, but to undermine that of the host. In real terms, this hybrid war against Ukraine translates into a shocking number of Russian weaponry pumped into the occupied Donbass and Crimea. It's now about 4,200 regular troops and up to 40,000 militants. It's about more than 400 tanks and 800 armored vehicles. It's up to 1,000 artillery systems and over 200 multiple rocket launchers, around uh, 23,000 troops in the occupied Crimea. Just a few hours ago, the Russian agent at the International Court of Justice made a completely ridiculous statement that the Russian-backed militants actually discovered all those weaponry been hidden in the old Soviet coal mines. It's, it's indeed the case just today. Can anyone believe it? Kremlin's war against my country over the last three years has led to over 7% of Ukraine being occupied. Almost 10,000 of my fellow Ukrainians, both military and civilians, losing their lives with a further 23,000 being injured. Just in the last six weeks, the Russians and their proxies launched a fierce attack against our troops and civilian population in Avdiivka. Russia has recognized the passports and documents issued by illegal entities in Donbas and has also completed the introduction of the Russian ruble as the currency in the occupied territory. Furthermore, Russia has also ordered the illegal expropriation of the key enterprises in the occupied territory. All this is nothing but a clear breach of each and every point of the Minsk peace agreement. The only viable way to negotiate with Russia is from a position of strength and international solidarity. And no new agreements should be made with Russia until such time as they have delivered on their provisions and commitments. So let me thank all of you for the enormous support which the United States has given to Ukraine, in particular over the last three years in our fight against the resurgent Russia. And all the signals from the new U.S. administration give us great hope that the United States' support for Ukraine will continue and increase. And this continued support is not just in the interest of Ukraine. It's in the interest of the United States and the freedom and stability of the wider transatlantic alliance. So I'm asking this subcommittee for its explicit support in a number of areas. Defensive weapons supplied by the US and continued military and technical support would make a powerful statement to the Kremlin and to prove significantly Ukraine's ability to defend its territory against the Russian army. This support has already shown its effectiveness. The battalion of the 
uh, 73rd Brigade, trained by the U.S. instruction, was one of the most effective in repelling the Russian attacks in Avdiivka. The units prepared by the U.S. instructors appear to be very effective on the front line. That is why we believe this kind of support and training is very important and should be continued. So I would like to ask you to support the appropriation of funds authorized for security assistance to Ukraine in the NDAA 2017. And please support the appropriation of funds for enhanced assistance to Ukraine in the U.S. fiscal year 2017 budget and of course, and of course forthcoming 2018 budget. Ukraine also needs a long-term security arrangement for closer partnership and cooperation on defense and security. The involvement of the United States will be key to any such arrangement work. Of course, we need U.S. support in relaunching the negotiations of the signatory of the Budapest Memorandum. The United States should play a key role in the negotiation both on Donbass and Crimea. And finally, until Russia gets off Ukrainian land, there must be no easing up of sanctions. If anything, they should be increased. Dear Senators, Ukraine is on, is on the front line and currently the only country fighting and dying to hold off Russia. And Ukraine does not simply ask for support. We currently spend 6.6% of our GDP on defense. At the same time, it's obvious that we need the U.S. and transatlantic solidarity with Ukraine and Ukrainian people. A strong, stable, and democratic Ukraine, able to defend its borders against Russian expansionism, is a crucial ally for the United States in the regional and globally. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. If you could, please try to keep your statements to five minutes. We're going to uh, questions where you can tell us anything on your mind, but uh, time is of the essence in the Senate. So thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify before the Senate subcommittee. It is an honor to be here, and I am pleased to be able to provide the view of Poland's government on Russia's policy in Europe and the challenging originating from it. The Kremlin has a chief strategic objective, restore the superpower status lost after the fall of communism. The way to achieve this goal seems straightforward, altering the security architecture in Europe, thus impeding post-Soviet countries from integrating with the Euro-Atlantic community. First, the current situation. While pursuing its foreign policy objectives, Moscow largely relies on force, intimidation, and economic extortions, trying to impose on other countries an autocratic and oligarchic form of government. Russia invite, invaded Georgia, harassed Moldova, meddled in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, and violated international law by annexing Crimea. Finally, the Kremlin masterminded and keeps fueling the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Although Moscow signed the ceasefire agreements Minsk I and Minsk II, it did not withdraw from the region what is the point of departure to achieve the political solution. Even worse, during the last weeks, we have seen increasing military clashes in the Donbass. Second, Russia is a growing military threat. President Putin embarked Russia on a large-scale modernization of its armed forces. The introduction of new types of equipment was coupled with the reform of the military doctrine. The, the threshold for the usage of nuclear weapons has been lowered. Kaliningrad, bordering Poland and Lithuania, became the most militarized region in Europe. Russia equipped the exclave with anti-access area denial capabilities. This A2AD bubble aims at limiting NATO's freedom of maneuver and action on allied territory. It covers an area spanning from northeastern Poland to the Baltic states. Moreover, Kaliningrad is equipped with Iskander systems, nuclear-capable missiles able of hitting targets in Estonia, Latvia, Poland, and even in eastern parts of Germany. 
Moscow conducts large-scale SNAP exercises with openly aggressive scenarios. We also observe an unprecedented number of military incidents provoked by Russia. But the most alarming issue is Russia's ability to, to take prompt and deceptive actions. We saw that in Crimea. Third, the hybrid dimension. The challenges posed by Russia's actions go beyond the conventional military realm. We see them in the cyber, informational, and energy domains. Russia deliberately employs hybrid means to act below the threshold of a military conflict. Moscow often acts by exploiting national vulnerabilities and sensitivities. This might involve actions in the cyber domain, frequently backed by a fierce propaganda effort. Ukraine is the case in point. While countries in Central Europe try to diversify their import routes, Russia promotes the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, creating divisions among EU member states. Should this project go ahead, Russia could effectively hinder the diversification efforts of the whole region. Increased gas supplies from Russia would inevitably affect the economic viability of LNG projects in Central and Eastern Europe. Fourth, our response. Two words, uncertainty and insecurity, best describe the current security situation we operate in. Such conditions and challenges call for an adequate answer. NATO is the best platform to provide it. It is a unique force multiplier. Deterring all those threats and challenges requires a swift and full implementation of the decisions taking, taken at the summit in Warsaw in 2016. Furthermore, my government believes that the special meeting of heads of states and governments should be an important milestone in the process of adapting the alliance's defense and deterrence posture. As the challenges we face are here to stay, the enhanced forward presence of allied troops on the eastern flank of the alliance should have a long-term character. Poland is very grateful for those actions. It would be impossible to achieve the Warsaw Summit decisions without American leadership. In this context, I would also like to thank you for deployment of your troops to our region under the NATO flag. A long-term American commitment to the EFP is absolutely essential. I would like to add that the presence of American soldiers in Poland as part of Operation Atlantic Resolve is of equal and paramount importance. Further congressional support for the European Reassurance Initiative would be greatly appreciated. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, a fair burden sharing among allies is a must. Poland meets the 2% defense spending target along NATO guidelines. More than 20% of our 2017 military budget will be spent on military equipment. Our soldiers serve in missions in Afghanistan and Kosovo. Poland contributes to collective defense. A Polish tank company has been deployed to Latvia under the framework of the EFP. Our vessel commands the standing NATO Maritime Group 2 operating on the Aegean Sea. Poland has always been ready to deal with the terrorist threat. Polish and American soldiers were brothers in arms during the missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Altogether, more than 40,000 Polish troops took part in both operations. Nowadays, Poland is an active member of the global coalition against Daesh. Moreover, our efforts go beyond the military domain. Last year saw the opening of an import LNG terminal in Poland. It could become a gateway for US-made LNG destined for clients in Central Europe. Delivering gas supplies to Ukraine via Poland would send a powerful political message whilst providing business opportunities for American firms. Moscow orchestrated the, co the conflict in Ukraine and Moscow has all the means to end it. Moscow signed ceasefire agreements, Minsk I and Minsk II, but does not respect their provisions. Moreover, Russia decided to recognize the documents produced by the so-called Donbas republics. 
To sum up, taking into account Russia's actions, we see no ground to ease the sanctions or to change our policy vis-a-vis -vis Moscow. Congressional support for maintaining trans transatlantic unity and solidarity on this issue is indispensable. A couple of weeks ago, General James Mattis said at the NATO headquarters that Europe and North America need to work together stronger than ever in times of turmoil and unpredictability. I firmly believe that the political and military engagement of the US is necessary for preserving peace and stability in Europe. Let me stress that we remain open to dialogue with Russia. However, such dialogue needs to be conditional on Russia changing its current policies and its stance towards international law. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. And to those who stick to five minutes, your chance of assistance goes up. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> An ambassador from Georgia. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to remind you that before Ukraine, Georgia was invaded in 2008 and 20% of our country remains under Russian occupation. Despite ongoing Russian aggression, with the support of the United States, Georgia has made tremendous strides in strengthening democratic institutions, fostering economic development to solidify an irreversible path, okay, to solidify an irreversible path towards European and Euro-Atlantic integration. I'm also here to tell you that we need a stronger America in Georgia and the region. The conflict which started in the early 90s reached its peak in 2008 with the Russian invasion of Georgia and occupation of our territories. As the international community failed to effectively respond to early warning signs, Russia continues its occupation with up to 10,000 Russian military security and FSB border guard personnel. The Russian occupation forces have no legal mandate and are in stark violation of international law and August 12, 2008 ceasefire agreement. In 2009, Russia began installing razor wire fences and other artificial obstacles along the occupation line. The total length of the trenches across both occupation lines is more than 62 miles. We greatly appreciate the interest of Congress and its both bodies and its representatives who are frequently visiting the occupation line. In further violation of ceasefire agreement, Moscow has signed so-called treaties with the occupation regimes. These documents represent a step towards annexation of Georgia's occupied regions, as they provide foundation for full integration into social, economic, administrative, and most importantly, military and security institutions of the Russian Federation. Georgia is pursuing an engagement and reconciliation process with the people in the occupied territories. We make all benefits which are available for Georgian citizens also accessible for our compatriots residing on the other side of the occupation line. Free healthcare, educational, cultural, scientific programs, other benefits of Georgia's European path, such as visa liberalization. Since regaining its independence to undermine Georgian sovereignty and territorial integrity, Russia has been subject to Georgia has been subject to different forms of unconventional hybrid warfare. Russian propaganda in Georgia, in addition to economic embargo of 2006, energy cuts, the cyber attacks in 2008, seeks to challenge and derail Georgia's European and Euro-Atlantic integration aspirations. It builds on fears that exist in different societies, creating myths and communicating through different forms of media. A recent example, is a spreading of a false information that the well-deserved visa-free travel decision for Georgian citizens to Europe came at the expense of building refugee camps in Georgia. The Georgian government has been effective in its strategic communication efforts through coordinated approach, dismantling myths, but also countering anti-Western narrative by bringing tangible results to the Georgian citizens like free trade agreement, association agreement with Europe, visa liberalization. As a result, we have managed to maintain strong support toward Georgia's EU and NATO aspirations within 70 to 75 percent. Overall, despite Russia's vicious efforts for a small nation, Georgia makes an outsized contribution in international security efforts, allocating more than 2 percent of our GDP 
for defense spending. We are a committed partner in fight against terrorism, and we are one of the largest contributors to the Resolute Support Mission in Afghanistan, with one of the highest number of 870 servicemen. Georgian soldiers are proudly standing shoulder to shoulder with allies in the most dangerous parts of the world. In recent years, we have made progress in building strong and effective state inst institutions, ensuring democracy, human rights, and rule of law, because we believe that our political and economic progress will ultimately serve as a potent antidote to Russia's expansionist designs. For the last decade, Georgia, as the most reliable and democratic ally of the U.S. in a very tough region, has been a great example of American taxpayers' money wisely spent. Therefore, I want to invite the members and the staff of this committee to visit and see firsthand the transformational power of U.S. assistance. Last year, we have signed a memorandum on deepening of security and defense partnership between our two nations, and we successfully launched Georgia Defense Readiness Program. Further improvement of these programs and elevation of our security partnership is of vital importance, as we believe Georgia remains an essential part of Euro-Atlantic security architecture. When the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union dissolved, the United States and its allies sought to build Europe whole, free, and at peace. Today, when of one of the basic foundations of security and peace, respect for national borders is violated, new transatlantic leadership is needed to fortify and enlarge the alliance. We believe a comprehensive, long-term engagement strategy of new administration will include the strengthening of Georgia's territorial integrity and sovereignty, improving bilateral trade, economic, investment relationship, and supporting the democratic choice of Georgian people to integrate with Euro-Atlantic institutions. All these measures will make Georgia stronger and more resilient. That is important because stronger Georgia is in the United States' interest as much as stronger America is in Georgia's interest. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. The Ambassador from Latvia. Chairman Graham, Ranking Member, lady, members of committee, thank you very much for inviting me to speak before this very honorable committee. Latvia and U.S. have a century-long history of truly fr friendly relations and very close partnership. Due to this partnership, Latvia has safeguarded its, its independence and it, this partnership has f facilitated uh, Latvia's integration back into the Euro-Atlantic community. We have to admit today that the world has become less secure and less stable of the past decade. Causes for instability are various and the geography of the threats is diverse. The continued U.S. global leadership is extremely important to safeguard an international rules-based order. A strong transatlantic link is the best answer for today's security risks. Since 2003, Latvian troops have shoulder to shoulder, have stood with the U.S. in fight against terrorism in Iraq and Afghanistan. We both have made sacrifices, and Latvia remains committed to fighting terrorism within the global coalition against ISIL. We can do more. We are ready to do more. In 2017, Latvia considers additional contribution to fight against terrorism in form of financial assistance. Threats around us, threats in the region become more complex and harder to identify, quantify, and pinpoint. Russia's actions vis-a-vis -vis its neighbors show a disturbing and worrisome trend that we have to reckon with. What happened in Ukraine? Russia's steady and systematic military built-up, as well as intensive military maneuvers in the proximity of NATO borders, like once symbolically named Zappa 2017, this year, they, are, they have caused a significant deterioration in European strategic security environment and are challenging the European international security order. This has direct impact on national security of Latvia, Europe, and NATO. To respond, we need a strong NATO as a source of stability and reliability. We need a prosperous and resilient European Union. We need effective OSCE capable 
to solving, not freezing, conflict. Thanks to historical decision of the NATO Warsaw Summit on the deployment of four multinational battle groups to Atlantic Eastern flank, including Canadian-led Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Group in Latvia, we are more secured and reassured. This is a very practical expression of solidarity from our allies and strong deterrent signal to Russia. Security in our region is greatly strengthened thanks to Congress support for the U.S. European Reassurance Initiative, the Atlantic Resolve Mission, and the Foreign Military financing program, for which we are very grateful. That taking into account the challenges to our region are of long-term nature, we are looking forward to continuation of European Reassurance Initiative at the funding level of the $3.4 billion or higher. Likewise, we hope that foreign military financing funding will be maintained or enhanced. The continuing U.S. commitment to NATO is essential to preserve irreversibility of these decisions. Latvia highly appreciates a very clear and resolute statement by U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis at the NATO Ministerial in Brussels last month, thus re reconfirming the U.S. strong support to our lines. The meeting of the presidents of three Baltic states and the vice presidents of U.S. in Munich in mid-February reassured us even further in this respect. Latvia is also stepping up and pulling more weights. Latvia is among the best examples when it comes to raising a nation's own defense capabilities. In case of military aggression, our own forces will be the first responders. We are defendable. In case of we are well aware that challenge, therefore, we are well aware of that challenge, therefore Latvia has spent past two years boosting its military capacity and improving its coordination. Currently we are spending 1.7% and next year, only a few months ago, we will spend 2% 2, 2 of GDP for our defense. Since joining NATO in 2004, Latvia has been not only a recipient but also a provider of security. In proportion to our population of 2 million, count, uh, we count among the top contributors in missions Afghanistan, Iraq, Balkans, Mali, Central African Republic, or Somalia. Europe and U.S. should join their efforts to help Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova counter threats of hybrid nature that are the mix of various elements, including information warfare. Latvia has been active in providing the support to the Eastern partners to counter propaganda and strengthen independent media. I would like to mention two examples of very practical approach and support towards Eastern partnership countries. First, its Baltic Center for Media Excellence recently completed a study of, on skills and training needs to independent media in the Eastern partnership countries. Secondly, Latvia is interested in the success of the Creative Content Support Fund that is being established with support of European Endowment for Democracy and the British government. This fund will strengthen the capacity of independent media to offer Russian language audiences a strong alternative to Kremlin-controlled media. We encourage the U.S. consider supporting these important initiatives. During the pivotal times of history, the alliance has always proven to be effective, credible, and united. Solidarity here is a key word. I believe the spirit of solidarity will bring us to wise future decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. The Ambassador from Lithuania. Chairman Graham. Is it on? Yep. Ranking Member Lee, a member of the subcommittee, Thanks, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to present our assessment of the threats Russia's policies pose to our democracy to explain what Lithuania is doing to counter those uh, threats and to explore the possibilities for cooperation between Lithuania and U.S. First of all, let me name the threats we face. Russia has never stopped using its political, economical, propaganda, and other open and undercover tools to make the democratic countries more vulnerable to the present-day challenges. 
The attack on Georgia, the illegal annexation of Crimea, and the war in eastern Ukraine are being perceived by Lithuania as having considerable implications to its own national security. Russia is increasing its military capabilities on the Lithuanian border. Kaliningrad is the most militarized zone in Europe. Large-scale military exercises of the offensive nature on our borders with Belarus are taking place regularly. Russia is extremely active in the information field, using pro-Russian media, propaganda, disinformation, fake news, trolls, and leaks in order to confuse public opinion and to influence the decision-making. Russia's international media channels spread its views on disinformation on the insensitive topics such as migration, terrorism, ethic, ethnic relations, deployment of NATO troops in Central and Eastern Europe. In my written testimony, you will find various examples of Russia's operations against Lithuania. Another security threat is Ostrovets nuclear plant, which is under construction in Belarus. Because of breaches in nuclear safety, it has the potential to become a second Chernobyl. How we, fi how we fight back these threats? In 2018, Lithuania will be spending over 2% of GDP on defense and plan to go beyond this benchmark in the future. We are modernizing our military by spending 31% of the budget for new weapon systems. The LNG terminal independence was one of the best investments into our security. As its name suggests, it ensures the independence of energy supplies and deprives Russia of one of its manipulation tools. It has also opened Baltic market for the potential LNG deliveries from the United States. Dear Senators, using this opportunity, allow me to thank you for, for your personal and United States support uh, to our security. We greatly appreciate the strengthening of the U.S. military presence in Europe and in the implementation of European Deterrence Initiative. We do believe that the best deterrence, therefore, the only way to achieve regional stability is to place U.S. and NATO troops in the Baltic states on a permanent basis. In our view, it is necessary to have forces and military plans adequate for deterrence. When it comes to practical areas of defense cooperation, Lithuania and the United States has been engaged, have been engaged in close dialogue, and our parts, on our part, we are ready to move forward with more precise bilateral projects and timelines with identified financial resources on both sides. The projects can include establishment of Baltic regional air defense capability, prepositioning of U.S. military equipment, procurement of ammunition, ESTAR capacities, among others. While paying due attention to defense issues, closer cooperation in counter-hybrid threats is necessary. To counter threats posed by disinformation, Lithuania launched the National Information Influence Identification and Analysis Ecosystem Project to monitor, analyze information environment, and preclude possible unfriendly actions. The possibility to access some of the U.S. services and tools would make this system more efficient. Currently, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, is broadcasting via Lithuania almost 10 hours a day in Russian and Belarusian languages. We see the need to increase the radio coverage and to improve the signal quality for the listeners of RFE RL in Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and we should aim at raising transmission power and extending the programming to 24 hours. We should also work together in creating an attractive and positive narrative about Western societies for radio and TV programs seen in the region. There is also great need to tell the true facts of history to the societies influenced by Russian propaganda. Finally, uh, we are aiming to strengthen border security. With the U.S. Army support, Lithuania will be launching a new so-called RAID system project. Lithuania also plans to build a situation awareness center that would integrate border, air, maritime situation pictures. U.S. experience and assistance in this area would be greatly appreciated. Once again, thank you for, your, for this opportunity to tell you our part of the story today. We much value our strategic partnership with U.S. We will continue to be your reliable ally, willing and hoping to work with U.S. Congress and U.S. administration very closely. Thank you, and I'm pleased to be on the mark first. Well, thank you. That's the model for the rest of us right there. You're, you nailed it. Lithuania is yeah. doing well. <laughs> Stony. Yeah. Get out the checkbook. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. My name is Eric Marme, I'm an ambassador of Estonia. Chairman Graham, ranking member Lee, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify before the United States Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations and Related Programs. It's an honor to be here. First, let me emphasize how important the United States steadfast support for the freedom and independence of Estonia has been. Our membership in Euro-Atlantic institutions is the cornerstone of our prosperity and security, and we are mindful of the role the U.S. has played in supporting and assisting us. 
As Russia's immediate neighbor, Estonia would like nothing more than to have good relations with democratic Russia, including prosperous trade and active everyday relations at all levels of society. But shared commitment to the core values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law are indispensable pillars for good neighborly relations. We shouldn't be guided by wishful thinking, but by real facts. Examples of Russian malign activities in Europe, to name but a few, include the Russia-Georgia war, the annexation of Crimea, the war in eastern Ukraine, provocative activities by the Russian military, and interference in Western democratic processes, including elections. We have learned that inadequate responses to such behavior can only feed future transgressions. I would like to stress that Russia's ambitions and activities are not only of concern to NATO's eastern flank or the countries represented at this hearing, but are influencing all our allies in the West. Therefore, it is essential not to regionalize the Russian threat of Eastern European countries, but to clearly recognize that the threat of Russia's subversive methods has expanded far beyond the eastern flank of Europe, including to the United States. We as neighbors to Russia are just a bit more used to witnessing such behavior. Upcoming elections in the Netherlands, France, and Germany are a perfect theater for the Russian dis disinformation warriors. The goal of Russia's influence and activities in Europe is to create tension and sow confusion between European Union member states and within individual states. By doing so, the Kremlin hopes to influence the decision-making process and steer the narrative and outcomes towards its own interests. The illegal annexation of Crimea in March 2014 succeeded largely because of a successful information war that allowed Russia to avoid a direct military confrontation. It can be expected that Russia will use this tactic, extensive manipulation of information to support its military goals in order to achieve strategic advantage in the future as well. This forces the adversary to doubt and verify the facts, thus delaying its response. The unity of the West, joint action and the decision to stay the course towards Russia has been the strongest message in response to Russian actions so far. To be credible, we need to stand by our values and be consistent in our policies. We need to take into account that Russia sees itself being in a confrontational era with the West for a long time. We, the West, need to address the subversive actions in a systematic and coordinated way within the European Union and NATO, but also in cooperation between these two organizations. This should be done in a very practical terms. We need to share more intelligence on Russia's subversive methods to decode the Russian hybrid method playbook. We need to raise the awareness of the decision makers and the public at large in order to limit the ability to abuse the open nature of our societies. We can do it by exposing or con countering Russia's malign tactics, such as covered support to political parties and politicians, seemingly innocent NGOs, or economic leverage gained through murky business connections. Also, transparency, regulation, and anti-corruption measures can and should be strengthened. The Kremlin makes extensive use of Russian and foreign language media outlets, as well as countless fake social media accounts. Merely con constant reaction to propaganda is not enough and can sometimes even be counter-effective. The quality of strategic communication capabilities and the formation of our own messages needs to be improved. The effect of disinformation can be diminished by enhancing critical reading skills within intended audiences. The best medicine against disinformation is an open and free, high-quality high and pluralistic media environment offering a variety of voices and opinions. I firmly believe this subcommittee plays an important role in effecting positive change in areas I've described above. Funding for initiatives that fall under the State Department, USID, the Broadcasting Board of Guyanas, the National Endowment for Democracy, to mention but a few, can all contribute to building capability and resilience in Europe in order to counter changes Russia is trying to achieve. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide you with my thoughts, and I'm ready to Forward look, I'm ready to look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and, and informing the subcommittee of what you face and uh, sort of a parade of horribles when it comes to Russia. Uh, Lithuania. There was a recent deployment of German soldiers uh, to Lithuania to help uh, train Lithuanian military. 
I've been informed that as soon as the soldiers from Germany arrived, there was an allegation that one of the German soldiers had raped a Lithuanian woman. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yes. Um, <coughs> it... Russians. You may have broken them all. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, uh, it didn't take long, Senator, uh, because uh, right after German troops have arrived, because of the decisions taken in Warsaw uh, for deployment and German uh, troops are leading the battalion in, in Lithuania, it's almost like uh, the second day or the next day of their arrival, after their arrival, there was a news spread that the teenage girl was raped by allegedly German troops. And it was absolutely nonsense. It was fake news. Uh, it was cooked. Uh, uh, and, and it was denied right away. But of course, uh, as, you, as you know, the fake news, they are probably not all people were listening to the denouncement uh, of this, that it's not true. And, uh, Did it come from a uh, Russian outlet, the news? Yes, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what we suspect. It's always difficult to, to, to get you know, a grip of uh, where it comes from first, but yes, that's what we suspect because uh, the very idea is very clear. The NATO troops in Lithuania are bad. Have you, have, have you experienced an uptick of Russian involvement since uh, President Obama drew the red line in Syria against Assad and nothing happened? Or has it been the same the whole time? Do you know what I'm talking about? Did that affect Russia's involvement at all, or is it all about the same? Uh, well, I... I I wouldn't, wouldn't say that there haven't been some significant changes. Well, we are experiencing Russian hybrid warfare already 25 years, and, and well, maybe we have become a little bit more resilient to it, but certainly it has never stopped, uh, and, and uh, certain narratives are not changing, and, and certain methods are still being used, and, and uh, in, in this sense, uh, very much has been disclosed by journalists itself, how are the methods, how tro trolling is, is, is doing, where, where the fake facts are, are emerging. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that yeah. uh, intensity has changed in the course of last years, but it, it hasn't diminished as well. Has it been constant? Russia's interference in your countries, has it been constant? Is it on the rise? Yes, uh, Chairman, it has been constant. As Latvian colleague said, we've experienced this for the past 25 years. Um, I think what really opened our, our eyes was 2007 cyber attacks against Estonia. That was politically motivated. And uh, even today, cyber domain remains one of the most important um, 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 sort of areas and um, and we we really need to put more emphasis on 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 this issue as well if, both if bilaterally I, but right. also in nato what do you think the consequences would be if our country forgave and forgot the interference in our election by russia what kind of effect do you think that would have on russia the ambassador from uh, ukraine foreign minister uh. Actually, Russia has developed a very systemic way on how to use all kind of unconventional warfare. My question is, what would the effect be if the United States did not act regarding the interference in our election? Look, would it embolden Russia? Now, there should be a clear way how to react on the Russians' interference. Otherwise, the Russians are always good in exploiting weaknesses. The and ambassador Russian from Poland, do you agree with that? Uh, I mean, it's difficult for me to, to, to make comments on what Americans should do or should right. not, or what would happen if, if, right. if Americans didn't do something. But, but I think that you know, investigations in such cases are essential in all countries. and. It, it, it cannot be covered, you know, just should be investigated, every case. To continue with what my colleague from Poland just said, I, as I have mentioned in our remarks, uh, as we think that international response on, on uh, 
invasion and occupation of Georgia was insufficient, and that might have led to the further aggression of Russian Federation towards Ukraine, etc. I think that international response is generally necessary in the violation of the international norms. Thank you all. Just, uh, we'll, you'll have a chance to tell the subcommittee specifically what we could do to help you regarding Russia on the soft power side. Senator Lee. Take more time on that. No. Right. Thank you. This has been uh, very instructive. And uh, Minister Glumkin, Klimkin, am I pronouncing that correctly? Thank you. Uh, in 2014, after Russia's annexation of uh, Crimea, the United States has supported the Ukrainian government against pro-Russian separatists. Now, during the past campaign, uh, Mr. Trump said during the campaign he might withdraw U.S. support, possibly as a deal with uh, Vladimir Putin, and said he'd also look into the... Um, into Russia's, into recognizing and approving of Russia's annexation of Crimea. So have you or any other uh, senior Ukrainian officials met with uh, President Trump or Secretary Tillerson uh, to discuss their policy toward Ukraine? You know, I've just met with the Secretary Tillerson a couple of hours ago, and Good. it was a very strong message of support for Ukraine, and uh, any kind of trade-offs are not possible. And our president had a true phone conversation with the President Trump, and it was the same very clear message. Did you say anything about Crimea? Uh, no compromise about Crimea, and uh, Crimea is the issue about rules and international law. Okay. Is, uh, how important is our aid to Ukraine? The U.S. support and U.S. assistance, both security-related assistance and reform-related assistance, was and is fundamental for Ukraine in the sense of our ability to counter the Russian aggression and in the sense of us creating democratic and European Ukraine. <clears throat> Thank you. Ambassador Vilcek, your, uh, your country, country of Poland, is uniquely positioned. Unfortunately, over, over the years, you've always been uniquely position uh, geographically between the, you know, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But that also has broader EU and NATO interests. Now, Russia's deployment of nuclear-capable miss missiles to uh, Kaliningrad, I assume that creates significant challenges for you. Am I correct on that? Uh. As I have just said, uh, the deployment of these missiles to Kaliningrad is, is very essential for our security. It's a kind of, even, I think it was a kind of breakthrough moment because it it's, um, uh, strengthens this feeling of insecurity and uncertainty. And it's not only about Poland, it's about uh, flexibility of NATO in this region, and it's about um, also about the Baltic countries and other countries. So um, this uh, this area, this this uh, Kaliningrad region, is an especially sensitive area, and as I said, the most militarized area in the whole of Europe. I think. Are you getting? Uh, do you get support from NATO? Do you feel that? NATO support is strong? Yes, we feel um, enormous support both from NATO and bilaterally mm -hmm. from the United States. So I think the, 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 whole, the, whole, um, the whole project of, of deployment and deterrence uh, implemented right now, and we understand still supported fully by the United States, is essential for, for our security and, and very important. The, um, 
I look at all the all the areas in there. I think of the Baltic areas, um, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and so on. Uh, do you feel any greater or less concern about a Russian invasion since the elections here in the United States? Anybody want to start with that? Well, um, I think we are we are concerned uh, since twenty, well, since twenty fourteen, or even before, since twenty oh eight, since events in Georgia or, or Ukraine. We are concerned because we we see that international rules based order is being challenged, and that's a concern for holds of Europe. It's a concern for holds of NATO, and here we we are considering that. The most important principle is indivisibility of NATO territory. And it doesn't matter which part of NATO can be challenged. It's a challenge for the whole NATO. And is this, in this sense, the assurances of NATO, the presence of NATO battalions, international uh, battalions on, on Baltic soil, and reassurance given by US in particular, that gives a strong sense of strong response to any, anybody who wants to challenge NATO as the strongest military organization. And that's the only response we can, we can expect from NATO. And that's a response that is understandable for everybody. And that gives us, as well, small nations, the good sense of assurance about our security, safety, and stability for the future. I, I take it you all, does anybody disagree with that? You all agree with the ambassador? Thank if you. I, if I just may add, Senator, I think Sorry. what we have seen in the past <clears throat> two and a half years, two NATO summits, Wales in 2014 and Warsaw last year, have made very important decisions. And it is important to implement those decisions. And we don't see any change in direction in that sense this is my answer to a question. If, if there is change of direction after the elections in the United States, no, we don't see that happening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Minister and Ambassadors, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Pardon me. As we make decisions about uh, spending money, taxpayer dollars uh, of American taxpayers, what would you highlight for me as the priorities that we should have in the financial aid that we provide your countries? Is there consensus? I mean, I'm happy to have one or a few of you respond to that if there's consensus in what's the highest priority. Well, Ambassador. if I may, probably the, the uh, programs that have been already mentioned today, this is a European Reassurance Initiative or Deterrence Initiative that has already started and finan financing is assured partly. We hope very much that this program will be financed fully and maybe even higher. Uh, as well, uh, foreign military financing uh, received by Baltic states is a very crucial point of uh, improving our uh, resilience, our, our capabilities. And the third I would mention uh, is uh, are the pro programs devoted to uh, counter hybrid, hybrid warfare. And this, these programs can be uh, in different shapes, whether it's strengthening of uh, free media, independent media, or countering the propaganda, uh, or uh, countering hybrid attacks. All of these programs are doing very relevant re uh, work to, to increase uh, resilience. Does anyone wish to add or detract, subtract, uh, Minister? Uh, the case of Ukraine is probably a bit different one, but in our case, it's definitely about uh, upgrading Ukraine defense and security sector to the NATO standards. It's about common and control. It's about training. And it's a kind of two-way road, because uh, we understand now the sense of hybrid warfare and unconventional warfare. So it's about exchange, but it's also about weapon supplies especially def uh, defensive weapon supplies. 
Let me uh, ask if any of you have other thoughts, if you'd get that to the committee. Uh, I want to ask a couple more questions, so if you'd provide that answer in writing, I'd appreciate it. Um, there are some EU members that are chafing uh, at the continued imposition of sanctions against Russia. Um, in your estimation, what's been, what, what do we need to do to keep EU um, unified in its support for those sanctions? And how significant is it uh, that the United States continue its sanctions in that effort? Ambassador. Senator, as long as we keep um, to the principle of Minsk agreements, there will be unity and on both sides of the Atlantic in the European Union and the United States. So those, this is a very clear message we should send to, uh, to Russia that Minsk is the basic um, fundamental um, uh, agreement that has to be fulfilled by all parties. And as long as this is done, um, as long as this is not done, the sanctions should continue. Um, if I may, Senator, I would add that um, as long as U.S. is strong on sanctions, and we understand that that's the strongest tool we have in our toolbox, so uh, that will unite Europe. Also, so this so U.S. We are having here U.S. leadership, if I can paraphrase, U.S. leadership matters in this yes. regard. Thank you. Uh, let me ask a question about energy. Uh, there's a RAND Corporation study that indicates Estonia, Lativia, Livia, and Lithuania and Poland are among the EU members most uh, vulnerable to uh, a problem with energy if Russia would take certain actions. And yet there's a 2014 European Commission study that uh, says that uh, there are cooperative measures among the EU that could significantly reduce the impact of any short-term uh, cutoff of supplies of energy. Uh, are those measures in place, the, the things that uh, are thought that could reduce the implications of um, an energy cutoff? Is the Euro EU taking the steps necessary to mitigate the damage? I would say that um, uh Building LNG terminal in Klaipeda in Lithuania and building the LNG terminal in Poland changes the situation uh, quite substantially, especially for Lithuania and Baltics. We do believe now we are strengthening our interlinkages between Latvia, uh, Lithuania, and uh, Estonia. So we are able to get gas from anywhere, including LNG from the United States, what I do expect to see in the future. So it's no longer possible for Russia to you know, blackmail us uh, on the gas. On electricity, we still have one, uh, one big project to come, uh, synchronization with the Western European grid, which is important. It's a it's quite intricated project. Uh, it will take time to develop, but that will be the last uh, straw you know, in, uh, in our independence. So that's, uh, that will make uh, Baltic states purely independent, uh, self-sufficient uh, in this regard. And I, I do believe that for the other countries, it could be different. Uh, Georgia and Poland. Uh... Uh, thank you very much, and let me combine it with your first question is uh, with regards to Georgia's provider of alternative diversifier routes for the energy supplies for Europe, which is not dependent on Russia. We now have two pipelines. The third one is under construction, Trans Anatolian pipeline, and the importance of strengthening Georgia and stability in Georgia as one of the alternative routes and pathways to supplying the alternative energy sources for the Europe is critical, and therefore one of the main attentions from the United States we expect in the energy sector. Thank, Thank you. Uh, as far as energy cooperation is concerned, um, I believe and we believe in Poland that it should be based on, on you know, mutual benefits. So it should be beneficial for, for those countries who cooperate, like the United States and countries of Central Europe. So this um, LNG, LNG terminal in Poland mentioned by my Lithuanian colleague is, is a very important part of this project of diversification. There is also a project uh, which is in progress of the Baltic pi pipeline with, with Denmark and Norway. And of course, there is a very, um, very important issue of Nord Stream 2 forced by Russia. And this is, you know, a project which divides, you know, European Union partners, because of course now it's it's suspended for for some time. But this is actually, you know, uh, interesting that as far as energy is concerned, 
um, Euro the European Union should be also the energy union. This, this is an idea very much, you know, uh, very much advertised by Poland uh, that, you know, the European Union, if it's not an energy union, there is no union. So uh, we really, you know, uh, think about diversification and, and cooperation with the United States, especially as far as LNG is concerned, is, is very important for Central Europe. Senator Coons. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in fact, I, I want to specifically thank you, Chairman Graham, as well as Ranking Member Leahy, for um, convening this hearing and for assembling um, these important ambassadors and uh, foreign minister uh, from vital European allies of ours uh, and focusing us in a bipartisan way uh, on how we can confront uh, Russian aggression uh, together. Uh, and I'm encouraged by your call that we create a counter-Russia account specifically to strengthen uh, our allied and partner democracies. This week is the 150th anniversary of the creation of this committee in the United States Senate, um, something that showed, I think, uh, the wisdom of the founders in recognizing that having a strong hand for uh, the Senate uh, in the shaping of our investment overseas um, was something that has enduring relevance. Uh, I joined uh, my colleague on this subcommittee, uh, Senator Marco Rubio of Florida, last week uh, in a bipartisan speech on the floor of Congress about the importance of countering Russian aggression. We reviewed many of the issues uh, that were raised uh, by the witnesses today based on trips that each of us have taken uh, to your various countries to um, hear from you directly about hybrid warfare, about the illegal and inappropriate invasion and annexation of Crimea and the ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine, uh, about the importance of our standing in solidarity uh, with our allies in, in Poland and the Baltic states, the real challenges that Georgia has faced uh, since it was the first uh, of you to be uh, illegally uh, invaded and to have some of its territory occupied in an ongoing disruptive way. I just want to mention two bills uh, here in the Senate that have already garnered bipartisan support uh, for those who have any concern about the absence of uh, bipartisanship here. Uh, the Counteracting Russian Hostilities Act uh, has 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats co-sponsoring it. It would make Russia pay the price uh, for its illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, for the ongoing violence in eastern Ukraine, for their support of Assad's murderous regime in Syria, uh, and their meddling in our own American elections last November. Uh, the other bill led by uh, Senator Graham, the Russia Review Act, would make certain that Congress has to weigh in before sanctions against Russia uh, could be waived. And I'm uh, proud to be a co-sponsor, as are many on this uh, subcommittee, uh, of these bills. Um, we continue to believe that the transatlantic alliance is absolutely essential. It's a force for stability in the world um, to maintain the world order that we work together to build over the last seven decades. So let me ask a few questions, uh, if I might. There's been uh, a rumored proposal by the administration um, to cut by as much as 37 uh, percent um, our State Department and USAID, which are essential for the funding of many of the uh, programs that we've been talking about. Um, what would the absence of American leadership in this area mean for your countries? Would you feel safer in the face of an aggressive Russia if we were to cut back on programs that we've just discussed, like Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, programs that support um, your resilience um, both in terms of your governance and democracy institutions uh, and in terms of our sustainment uh, of some of the development initiatives. Would any of you care to speak to that question? Please, Mr. Ambassador. Senator Kuhns, I think this is just a rhetorical question. Yes. The question, we will not feel safer when, you know, the budget for, for such projects will be essentially cut. So we hope that it's just a kind of deliberation, a kind of, you know, um, tweeting, not, not really uh, a decision, because this sounds very dangerous, but we hope that, you know, it's, it can be, still can be changed, and people who, who think this way will change their minds, because American leadership in this region is essential, and you know this very well, that that's, there is a great support for, for American leadership in this part of Europe, maybe more than in, in other parts of Europe. So uh, we really rely as countries of the, of the region on, on firm American leadership. Um, I support. heard uh, in several visits um, by my colleagues and a visit I took last August about the importance of our strengthening our investment in countering Russia today, Sputnik and other propaganda outlets. You referenced, Mr. Ambassador, um, the broadcasting from um, Lithuania, excuse me, from Latvia, um, um, both uh, for Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and Radio Liberty. Um, 
Yes, my, my vision is not so good. That is very tiny print. <laughs> um, tell me how Russian propaganda operations are affecting your country and how we might strengthen uh, and expand our investment in counter Russian propaganda operations that would be more effective. Well, to, to give a short answer, uh, probably we are less concerned in Latvia about Russia today because Russia today is, is uh, pr well, program, programs of Russia today are br being broadcasted in English. Well, Rus Russia has all the opportunities to broadcast in Russian their major TV channels, and that's what Russia is, is doing, and well, Latvia's uh, democratic country is not putting any any barriers to uh, free speech, to, to free broadcasting. Well, at the same time, we are aware about the content of, of these, these programs, and what is essential is to, to give an alternative, alternative to different sources, to reliable sources, and to give, give an alternative of broadcasting in, in Russian, to be understandable, but, but to be objective, reliable, and different from those uh, major TV channels broadcasted from Russia. One last question, if my Mr. Chairman, just to the ambassador from Georgia. Um, I understand that OPEC uh, has helped make possible significant uh, programs uh, in Georgia uh, over the last 20 years uh, in modernizing uh, industries and in, in agriculture. Um, can you comment at all on the value of OPEC in helping make possible uh, mutually beneficial programs in Georgia? There are several uh, programs that OPEC has uh, implemented in Georgia, which is uh, really productive, not only uh, for developing Georgia, modernizing its uh, economic potential, but is also beneficial for both sides, and therefore, uh, in that regard, I can provide in more detailed way for the uh, submit in a written way more detailed information. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience. Thank you. Senator Bozeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador Bakradze, uh, in your testimony, you talked about Russia creating borders on the edge of territory. It is occupied in Georgia. Can you talk a bit about the recent closing of two of these uh, controlled crossing points and the impact that it's had for Georgia's uh, territory integrity? Thank you very much, Senator, for that question. Uh, very recently, just two days ago, uh, Russia-controlled uh, forces in uh, the Abkhazian-occupied region have closed two checkpoints. That is uh, affecting... Uh, free movement of uh, people that is affecting free movement of school children uh, over the uh, occupation line uh, and we are really appreciative of a very strong statement that uh, um, that the state department has made with regards to these developments also one more very recent development was the initiation two weeks ago by the de facto Valley region authorities to hold a referendum about renaming this region into the one associated with the, one of the Russia's autonomous republics. And uh, we also appreciate very strong statement that was made by the U.S. Department of State with this regard. These kind of developments continue, but we believe in a peaceful resolution of this problem. We believe in the Geneva discussion where U.S. authorities are actively contributing. Thank you. Thank you. So you were pleased with the, with the American response then in regard to... Uh, there was a very strong uh, statement just yesterday made by the uh, State Department about the closure of these two checkpoints with explaining what kind of uh, humanitarian difficulties it will create for those people residing adjacent to the occupation line. Let me ask all of you, or, or just whoever wants to jump in, uh, uh, which U.S. US administered programs in your country seem to have the most impact, and are there ways that we can improve them? So what's working? What, what programs do you like the most, and uh, uh, you know, how can we make them better? Yes, sir. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we are really appreciate you. We are celebrating 25 years of uh, uh, our diplomatic relations this year. And uh, we believe that uh, the U.S. assistance during these 25 years were essential for the survival, for transformation that Georgia has been through, for creating democratic institution, solidifying civil society, and um, making new opportunities for our people. These are the assistance that comes through USAID, that comes through FMF, uh, for supporting Georgia's resilience when it comes to the defense and security cooperation and supporting Georgian democracy and the rule of law when it comes to the USAID support. We believe there is a space for more cooperation on trade, economic, and investment direction, as we believe that security is also coming through the economic means. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I would say that any support uh, that you could give to Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty in developing their content and uh, strengthening their capacity to reach longer distances, uh, that will matter a lot. So that's, uh, that's the most important. I myself, I'm still old enough uh, you know, to, to, to remember the Soviet times when uh, my father was listening. I was a kid at that time. My father was listening to um, Radio Free Europe. And I know what kind of impact it was. It was eagerly sought every, more, every evening. The hour was there. There are plenty of people in Lithuania sitting by the radio and listening to it. It was really a word of freedom. So the more word of freedom you could spread, spread through the region, the more secure region will be, because that will be destroying the monopoly on news. Mm -hmm. So you like the content, but stronger broadcast. Yes. Very good. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Um, I would emphasize that in the Stoney case, uh, the most efficient uh, funding has come through uh, foreign military fund and also ERI, or the European Reassurance Initiative. So most of the American taxpayers' money has gone to the um, um, capabilities, but also infrastructure buildup. We have received about 75 million US dollars from the ERI funding in recent uh, two years. And um, we have spent that money on infrastructure, but also on the uh, capability development on the uh, anti-tank weapons. Uh, also, FMF money, um, which is very important, and hopefully it will be increased in the coming years, uh, goes to the uh, very important uh, capability developments. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. I very quickly. Yes, if I can add uh, just to what my Estonian colleague said, European Reassurance Initiative is, is most important from our, for us, and uh, we would like to thank you for just this great in, in, in increasing the, the, this, this program from one to three billion. It's, it's very, very essential. Um, but also uh, what uh, my colleagues mentioned as well, uh, um, all kinds of exchange of people, all kinds of programs, uh, we, we, you know, um, we do, not, we do need Radio Free, Free Europe and such projects, but not to such an extent as it was under communism. Now people can move, can visit each other's countries. And so I think that support for programs like Fulbright and all kinds of exchange programs is also very, very important. It's just people going both ways and learning about each other's. And I think that for for strengthening American support, support of American citizens and taxpayers. It's very important that American taxpayers also see our countries and see them uh, from, thanks to exchange programs, which I think are now underestimated. Their role is underestimated. Thank you. Senator Durbin. <clears throat> Maybe Thank just, you very much. Just to add my, my, my support to what, what has been said of, of ERI and, and for the military <laughs> financing, that's really some kind of value added above our own national contribution, national investment procurement programs that really gives a very focused strengthening of uh, uh, all the cap capabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Uh, each of you is welcome to come back to or to visit Chicago which I'm honored to represent, where you will find many people from your homeland, and you will find many great restaurants. Estonia, not so sure, but uh, <laughs> for, the, for the rest, I guarantee it. It will be well worth the journey, and we'd be honored to have you visit. Uh, so three weeks ago, we had our first break, and I decided to visit Warsaw, Vilnius, and Kiev. 
uh, for the very reason that we're meeting today, because I knew there was anxiety and concern about the future of NATO and the future relationship between the United States and your countries. Uh, and it was a good, uh, good visit. There were many things I came home with, uh, having met with uh, President Poroshenko, having met with President Grybauskaitė, and uh, with the leaders in, uh, in uh, Poland, as well as so many other countries. But I remember one comment particularly from four days in travel. The man's name was Zbigniew Bizarski. He works for the Kazimir Pulaski Foundation. We had dinner in Warsaw, and he asked me a question, which goes to the point of the opening made by the chairman. He said, we are wondering, if the United States does not take the Russian invasion into your election seriously, will you take the Russian invasion into Poland seriously? I thought about that question. I've thought about it ever since. And I want to salute the chairman here, who has been one of the few who's been willing to step up and speak out about how uh, this outrage of the cyber attack by the Russians into the American election should not go unnoticed and certainly should be responded to. That is a starting point to our credibility when it comes to our relationship with Russia. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for what you said earlier. I could go through a litany, uh, I won't, of my concerns on the security side, and most of them have been touched on here, whether it is Kaliningrad, whether it is the Zapat, which the Russians are planning to put 100,000 Russian soldiers into Belarus in September on the borders of Lithuania and Poland and Ukraine. And there is serious concern about what they might do next after we've seen what they've done in Ukraine, what they could do with these troops on the border there for this so-called military exercise. We are concerned about the hybrid war. I hadn't heard that term before, but I heard it throughout my visit. The hybrid war, not just the military side of it, but the cyber side of it and the propaganda side of it. I guess my question, uh, in addition to my suggestion, number one, Mr. Chairman, that when we commit NATO forces and our allies, Germany in Lithuania, I believe it's uh, UK in Latvia, am I correct on that, and uh, Canada into Estonia, I would hope the United States would always have a complement of our uniforms and forces as part of it. It's not a negative thing in terms of their capability but it's a demonstration, a symbol, that the United States is committed to this NATO alliance in every one of these deployments. The other thing I would hope is that in Ukraine, your president, I said to him, what do you need? And he said, in the Budapest Agreement, we gave up 1,000 nuclear missiles. Can you give us 1,000 anti-tank missiles? And I understood what he was saying. They need that for the protection of Ukraine and to stop any incursion of Russians into the rest of your country. But the point I want to get to is this, Mr. Chairman, and close, and that is we have to learn what they've already experienced. We have to learn what the Russians have done to you, which led to decisions in Lithuania to suspend RT for a number of months, which led at some point to a cyber attack on Estonia, which crippled your economy. You've been through these experiences. Now we are being threatened with the same thing. We can teach you many things about the military. You can teach us about these other aspects of the hybrid war and prepare us so that the next election is not another uh, victim of Russian aggression. I know you've talked about this and I won't uh, dwell on it any further because I know Senator Van Hollen would like to ask questions too. But I thank you all for coming. We value your friendship. We value this alliance. It is strong, bipartisan strong in Congress. Thank you. Uh, very quickly. If I can just respond to Senator Durbin, uh, what you raised is a very important issue is the uh, American uh, troop presence in the Baltic states. Um, you correctly mentioned that there will be enforced um, your, uh, forward presence of NATO. As we speak, the British actually are moving into Estonia with uh, 1,200 men. There will be full operation capability of these forces by June this year. But what I want to emphasize here, and you pointed out, is that the American presence in the, in the, in the Baltic states should remain. Uh, we have a company size units in each country right now, and uh, we would like to see them being embedded to that battalion. Just, uh, S Chairman, if, if I may, supporting 100% uh, what was told by my colleague from Estonia, but I just wanted to thank uh, Senator Durbin for visits to those important capitals you mentioned, uh, those visits are also very important. So it's a part 
of showing our partnership to the world that we are strong together. And so it's very important and I'm very encouraged and thankful to all senators who are visiting our countries uh, to send this very strong partnership message we are getting. And there are plenty of uh, Lithuanian restaurants in Chicago. On that note, Senator Blunt. Well, thank you, Chairman. And um, I've been in five of your six countries. I was in Estonia um, a year ago in September when we had a reserve A-10 unit there from uh, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri, and they were back again for an, uh, even a more extended period of time this year. But following up on what Senator Durbin uh, said was really the question I wanted to pursue anyway. You know, we clearly understand Russian uh, improper involvement in our elections. Uh, it's a wide belief that they're currently involved in both the upcoming German and the upcoming French elections. Uh, but you all have experience with this as well. And I wondered if uh, uh, you'd want to share maybe one at a time some sense of in what you saw through RT uh, or through um, manipulation of, uh, of your infrastructure in ways where you feel like the Russians were improperly involved or everybody maybe in, some, in a couple of cases understands improper involvement in your election situation. If you could share uh, some of that with us, that would be helpful. And I'm wondering if we just start maybe Mr. Marmay with, uh, Ambassador Marmay with you. Thank you, Senator. I think one of the um, very clear um, sort of operations of influence uh, that I mentioned earlier also was the cyber attack in 2007. We see those um, s cyber hackings um, on a daily basis. It's continuous. Um, I think it's also important to point out that there Kremlin-backed Russian-language TV and media channels are um, trying to influence the Russian-speaking population in Estonia and uh, in other countries. It's not specifically Estonian issue. It's everywhere else. We have to really deal with this. We have, uh, two years ago, opened a Estonian broadcasting company, Russian uh, language channel to counter that um, uh, propaganda. Um, I think what we see is also a lot of um, intimidation when it comes to the security of our borders, airspace, mm -hmm. um, the violation of air and maritime borders. Um, we have to deal with this as well. Um, we have to deal with the support of or the influence of the NGOs um, in, in our countries as well, and also academia. This would be Russian influence on the NGOs? Yes. Right. I'm, I'm going to run out of time here. I will say that uh, the visit that I made there a year ago, I think the day, one of the two days that I was there with our A-10 pilots, the Russians were practicing invading Estonia 20 miles away from the Estonian border, and it was very publicly uh, clear that that was the purpose of that uh, exercise. Uh, Mr. Chris Kunis, anything in uh, Lithuania you'd want to talk about? Uh, I, I would say, uh, Senator, that, um, of course, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to influence uh, election in Lithuania, probably, for, for Russian propaganda, even though I would say that uh, there clearly probably are trials in there, but because in Lithuania there is almost like 80% support of EU membership and uh, NATO. So it's very difficult, it's not popular, you know, to go uh, against those topics which uh, Russia would like to destroy. So what we see, we see the efforts by some media outlets uh, to put doubt on NATO relevance. So any, anything could be exploited to cook the fake news which, uh, which would show to Lithuanian public that Americans are not with you. They are looking the other way and, and things like that. So the fake news uh, of similar uh, nature would be the ones which are being cooked in, uh, in Lithuania, trying to cast a doubt, of course, in general, 
of the people believing in the government, uh, in believing in the NATO, but trying to push, for example, NATO, let's be neutral. You know, so why Lithuania, why Lithuania should be NATO member? Let's be neutral. So it seems like, you know, it's uh, the very vague message. It's not like against NATO, but well, why we're not neutral? We are not militaristic a nation and so on. So that's, uh, that's kind of news which are being uh, uh, probably most exploited in Lithuania. Uh, Ambassador Tatmanis. Uh, well, I can, I can join, join to assessment of, of my colleagues. I would I'd point three, three directions we are facing when, when we see uh, hybrid warfare. One is Russian TVs, TV channels that are broadcasting in Russian. And the ma major narrative is probably uh, linked not only to Baltic states, but also to uh, European Union. And this narrative tells that, well, European Union is economically collapsing. And that was a great strategic mistake by of Baltic states that they have joined to European Union. And the only way how to get back to prosperity and welfare is, is to come back to Russia and through Russian economy get, get to high welfare. Another way is uh, uh, financing of uh, NGOs. While the, the persons in NGOs are not so numerous and each of them are, are working in several NGOs, financed by, by different kind of Russian foundations and, and having, uh, well, very nice names linked to protection of human rights or, or, or European research or, or whatever. Uh, and they are pretending to be fighting for the rights of Russian speakers and, uh, well, allegedly uh, developing another narrative that Russian speakers in, for instance, Latvia are abused and, and facing massive uh, ab abuse of their human rights. And probably the third I would mention is a rather strong work in, in social media, uh, spreading out uh, different well, fake news, trolling. Uh, well, like, like we, we saw quite recently, uh, well, th that's another indication probably whether, whether the news is important for for, uh, for this warfare, uh, just when uh, pr Operation Atlantic Resolve started and US troops started its move to, to Poland from, from Germany, well, the new headline appeared on different sites, websites that over 3,000 tanks are rolling, NATO tanks rolling towards Russian border. No. Well, that, that, was, that was spread out in, in news lines and, and, and social media. Well, thank you. I think the point, Chairman, here is well taken, that there's a lot we can learn by sharing what we learned from what happened here, but also looking at what our friends have consistently dealt with for two decades uh, now. And uh, thank you for letting me use a little extra time. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I think that's one of the central questions of this whole hearing. If you could, the ones who didn't comment could put in writing examples of interference in your election system, because that's very important. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Minister and uh, ambassadors uh, for your testimony today. Mr. Chairman, it's great to be on uh, this subcommittee, and I want to join uh, our colleagues on a bipartisan basis for thanking you for your leadership uh, in general for putting together this hearing, uh, because Russian interference in our elections is not a Democratic Party issue. It's not a Republican issue. Uh, it's an American issue. In fact, it's an issue obviously important to Democratic countries around the world, as all of you are testifying uh, to today. Uh, you have had this experience over many, many years uh, with uh, both the sort of military challenges and threats, but also uh, the intimidation through various means of uh, propaganda. Um, the propaganda invasion is a little bit new to the United States in terms of our elections. We are seeing it, as Senator Blunt said, uh, in the upcoming elections in France uh, and Germany. And Mr. Chairman, I would agree with your opening statement, which is that if we do not respond, then we will allow those actions to be encouraged. Um, if they can do this kind of interference with impunity, they will do it again and again and again. So uh, I support the legislation that would, uh, first of all, require congressional consent before we roll back any sanctions. And I also support the legislation that would go further. I think we need to now impose sanctions on a bipartisan basis to send the signal you're talking about. Because if we don't do it, 
uh, we're simply going to be encouraging uh, this kind of interference in uh, elections uh, going forward. And I appreciate the testimony from all of you as to the lessons learned and look forward to getting the, some of the written observations uh, from others. Um, I, I would say that obviously we need to strengthen our cyber capabilities across the board. I mean, this is the new dimension uh, of security, uh, of warfare. Uh, and I, I am you know, pleased Maryland, my state of Maryland is, is the home of the US Cyber Command. Um, and uh, Ambassador Marmy, I know Estonia takes the lead uh, in NATO with respect to uh, cybersecurity. We also have a good relationship between the Maryland National Guard uh, and your efforts uh, on behalf of uh, NATO, and look forward to strengthening uh, those, uh, those ties. With respect to cybersecurity, uh, what I would like is very quickly for sort of each of you to try and grade what you think is our current capabilities and whether you think this is an area where um, we need to put more uh, resources um, and how vulnerable are we today? We know the Russians are <laughs> very involved uh, every day in trying to uh, penetrate our systems. And uh, I would, starting with you, Ambassador Marmé, uh, because of Estonia's lead within NATO, if you could give us some assessment of where you think we are. Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, we have good news and bad news, I think, um, or bad news and good news. First of all, I would like to also uh, thank you for uh, the really good cooperation that um, Estonia and Maryland uh, have enjoyed in the past 25 years, especially the cooperation between Estonian uh, armed forces and, um, and your National Guard. Your 175th Air Wing has been to Estonia. You have 21 planes there, 18 of those have been to Estonia. So this is excellent. And also the cooperation uh, with your cyber uh, uh, defense uh, unit there is, is developing very fast. Um, now, it's clear, as you pointed out, that cyber is the new domain of warfare. What is good is that NATO really recognized that last year in, uh, during the Warsaw Summit um, and, and clearly pointed out that cyber warfare is the fourth domain of warfare. Um, but a lot remains to be done in this area. Um, we have to be, all our countries individually have to put more resources into that. Uh, but we should also collectively deal with these issues, um, also on a bilateral basis between uh, relevant countries, um, but also with NATO, which is, as you know, Estonia hosts the uh, NATO Cyber Center of Excellence. I would encourage you, when you talk about the, the further funding of, of, of the countering hybrid warfare, to uh, find more resources to, uh, to put to that center as well, and to have more people in NATO headquarters also to deal with this issue. It, it will not fade away. It will, this issue will be with us um, for the good part of this century, I think. So um, we have to really put more emphasis in this. Thank you. And everyone else can, in writing, uh, respond because we're running out of time. There's a vote uh, being called any minute now, and I think there are a couple of members of the subcommittee on their way, so I want to make sure everybody who, who can can ask questions. Uh, very briefly, what have I learned, and make sure that I've got this right. There's been a systematic effort to undermine democracies in your country by Russia for years. Does everybody agree with that statement? Let the record reflect an affirmative answer. <laughs> Prior efforts to deter Russia have failed. They're getting more aggressive, not less. Affirmative answer. Without American leadership, nothing will work. Affirmative answer. All right, who do we have? Two members on the way. We have two members on the way. Senator Van Hollen, if you want to continue until they come. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, look, I, I think, um, and this is a discussion for members of Congress, I, I do believe that, as you've indicated, that uh, we, we need to come together across party lines uh, to respond, and uh, we need to learn from, you know, your, your own experiences, the kind of 
measures um, that we need to be on the one lookout for, but, but we also need to be very focused on what we're doing. Let me ask you this. I mean, I, 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 if the United States does not take any affirmative action beyond what President Obama already did uh, with respect to the Russian interference in our elections, do you believe that would embolden Russia to uh, take these actions um, on an even larger scale uh, in your countries and other uh, democracies around the world? And for the record, you can answer that because we have Senator Daines, if that's okay. It's a very good question, but I want to make sure everybody can ask questions. Uh, Senator I Daines. I think this is really important to show unity and resolve. Um, to do it individually, on a bilateral basis, between our countries, but also through uh, um, NATO, and uh, in our case, in the European Union, which is also a very important uh, organization for us. So um, a lot remains to be done, but we have to show resolve and unity. Otherwise, what you describe will become true. Senator Daines, I've been told the vote is on, so we have about seven or eight minutes probably. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here and your service and representing your respective countries and your interests here in the United States. The United States values our strong relationships and our alliances, and strengthening these ties can help improve the security and certainly the stability across Eastern Europe. Many of you also represent NATO allies. This alliance has proven to be an effective and steadfast bulwark against aggression and terrorism in Eastern Europe and around the world. It is critical that NATO remains strong and continues to receive robust support from the U.S., particularly in light of ongoing Russian aggression that undermines regional stability and threatens our national security. Russian interference isn't limited to the security fear either. Disinformation campaigns seeking to discredit alliances such as NATO, cyber attacks, or substantially raising energy costs as a means to influence other countries have occurred far too frequently. See, Mr. Ambassador, we'll check. Uh, what threats from the Kremlin do you view as the most imminent? whether it's to Poland, NATO, or the region as a whole? Threats from Kremlin, which threats I, uh, I just... Yeah, wh yes. which, which threats do you view from the Kremlin as most imminent, most urgent, whether it's to Poland, to NATO, or the region as a whole? I think it's to the whole uh, Western world, or, or transatlantic alliance, I would say, both Europe and the United States. Now, during the, you know, the cyber war is going on every day, all the time, and it's a threat for everyone because it's, it doesn't depend on how far you are from, from Kremlin. You know, you can be 500 miles, you can be 5,000 miles, and so you can be, you know, a dictatorship or democracy, you know, there are various ways of, of, of uh, using this hybrid war and, first of all, cyber war. So I think that uh, everyone is vulnerable and what is essential for our countries to be uh, in our message for NATO and the United States and our countries to be, to be unambiguous because uh, what is the most dangerous thing, I, I think especially as far as uh, the war against Ukraine is concerned that many messages from various countries are, it's not unanimous, it's not, uh, you know, univocal, it's not clear cut, that this is the war. I think that that's, this should be stated openly, not that there is, there is Crimea, there is Donbass, no, there is a war against Ukraine. And I think that there is also a war, a cyber war, against so many other countries. So in light of that, um, what in your view would be the very best and most effective response to Putin's hybrid efforts to advance his goals, whether it's energy, informational, or cyber? 
Well, it's both, you know, energy and information and cyber. I think that, first of all, the, uh, the cooperation on energy should be strengthened and the position of, for example, of the European Union against should be unambiguous because otherwise it's, it's dividing the Union when various countries have various opinions about energy cooperation. So I think that the cooperation of, of this region with the United States should be strengthened as far as energy is concerned. And uh, I think that until today, I've just returned from a, from a conference on cybersecurity organized by Visegrad countries, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic and Hungary. And I think that we are still not aware how important this new kind of war uh, is, 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 is conducted uh, today. So Th I think cyber should be the most important, yeah. the most essential way of cooperation. You brought up the issue of energy as well as cyber. I want to uh, switch gears here, uh, Ambassador Marme. As you know, or may not know, uh, my home state of Montana is one of the leading energy producing states in the United States. In fact, we have more recoverable coal than any state in the United States. Uh, Montanans understand the importance of having access to reliable and affordable source of energy, and undoubtedly so do Estonians. Question is, how dependent is your country on Russia for its energy needs, and what concerns does that raise? Thank you, Senator, for this question. I think Estonia enjoys a rather um, diff different situation in the region in that sense that we are not reliant on Russian energy. The only energy that we use or import from Russia is gas, but it only forms about 7% of the total energy consumption. Estonia is reliant on, on, on oil shale, which we uh, generate to produce electricity. So in that sense, um, we are not really dependent on Russia. But there is a bigger issue here, which is that as long as the, the region, the Baltic region, is still considered as an energy island inside the European Union, then it's not a matter of how dependent Estonia is, but the question really is how safe the whole region can be from the Russian um, energy influence and, and tools. W so, would, would the region be more secure if that dependence was on the United States versus Russia? Well, the U.S. plays an, a very important role here, especially when it comes to the LNG and the, uh, the export to, mm -hmm. to Europe, which is, um, I understand, the issue of licensing. And, uh, and this is clearly what, um, what Lithuania is looking forward, to get more American LNG um, to Europe, to Lithuania. Also, it's important to mention that Estonia actually exports 30% of our gas from Lithuania today. So it's only 8% from Russia. And this shows how important the, the, the connections between um, uh, these countries when it comes to pipelines and then power grids is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Uh, we have just a few minutes left on the vote. Senator Rubio uh, is in a classified intel committee hearing, and he cannot uh, make it by 4.15, which is the time we have to all leave. Uh, so I'll make sure he can ask you questions in writing. I know he's been very, very good on this issue. To all of you, thanks for coming. I think this has been opening, at least to me, and I, I'm sure to every member of the subcommittee. My goal is to inform the American people of the risks uh, that, that you have being in the backyard of Russia as a democracy, that they're coming after us, France and Germany, until somebody stops them. And we're going to try to give you more tools in your toolbox to fight back, because the safer you are, the safer we will be. And to all of you, thank you very much. You've been very brave to come here today. And uh, to our friends in the Ukraine, keep your chin up. Uh, I think the ambassador from Poland got it right. We need to get Ukraine right before anything else will happen. And every effort to stop Russia in the past, whether it be Georgia, the Ukraine, you name it, is clearly not working. And my goal is to come up with something that will work. I want a better relationship with Russia, but that never will be achieved until Russia changes its practice of trying to grind democracy into the ground. I can understand why Putin's afraid of democracy. I can't understand why America and others will not defend it. I just met with President Trump. I think you're going to have a good ally in President Trump in terms of having a 
rotational troop presence in a permanent fashion, that the Ukraine will uh, be helped more, not less, and that we will push back against all Russian aggression. And uh, I look forward to working with him and my Democratic and Republican colleagues to give you some hope in the region that America's back and that uh, this subcommittee is just the beginning of uh, what I think will be a long journey. Our next uh, hearing will be March 29th, and we'll look at civil society's perspective on Russia and Russia's regional influence. To all of you, thank you very much. Your, thought, your country is in our thoughts and prayers, and uh, I want you to see in America a more reliable ally in the future. Thank you. The hearing is adjourned.